Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. This is Hugh Ballou with co host David Dunworth. Center Vision Leadership Foundation is where we help leaders articulate their vision and create synergy around the vision, hence the name Center Vision. It's the synergy of what we do as leaders. It's similar to what we create as conductors and musicians in orchestras and choirs. It's the ensemble of the culture. Our guest today is Julie Pham, PhD. Julie is here from uh, Seattle, Washington. And um, Julie, tell us a little bit about your background, you know, just a, a wee bit about who you are and what prepared you to do this really great work that you're doing. Mm. So really important part of my identity. I'm a Vietnamese refugee boat person. My parents and I came here when I was two months old and they started the first privately owned Vietnamese language newspaper in the Pacific Northwest. I got my training as a historian and I decided that I didn't want to stay in academia. And so I left academia and I came back to Seattle in 2008, start of the Great Recession to help run my family's Vietnamese newspaper. That's where I got my real life MBA. And this is important, I think, for your audience because I started volunteering a lot. I started joining nonprofit boards. I And so I actually feel that my nonprofit work, my volunteering was part of was part of my special topics in getting that real life MBA in learning how to communicate how to uh, how to fundraise and then I ended up actually the best job I ever had was six years as an executive of, of community engagement at a nonprofit that worked with the the tech industry and that was before I started my company curiosity based and again in in the middle of the pandemic so I seem to recession pandemic those are times for big changes. Yeah. That's where people that really are motivated get something going because everybody mm -hmm. else is pulling back. So kudos to you. Kudos to you. Now, um, our title today of this is the rubber band rule of respect, uh, seven forms of respect, communication skills in the workplace. So give us an overview of what we're going to talk about. What's that all about? Well, so you know, when people think about respect, they think about the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Right. And so the thing is with the golden rule, what if people don't want to be treated the way you want to be treated? And then there's the platinum rule, which is treat people the way they want to be treated. Well, what if you don't want to treat them the way they want to be treated? So there's actually what I have the rubber band rule, which I will get to. I'll explain what the rubber band rule is. It shows, though, how respect is dynamic, it's subjective, it's relative, and it's contradictory. Oh, I love it. This is the way I think, David. She must have been reading. My <laughs> I think she's been sneaking in your house on the weekend. <laughs> so, 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 Julie, your focus is on curiosity. What does curiosity have to do with respect? So, this is even though seven forms of respect is a, it's a communication relationship framework. I actually think of it as a tool to spark curiosity. We talk about respect, or um, it's a tool to spark curiosity around respect. We talk about respect as if it's fixed and universal. So David, David and I can go back and say, David, I need you to respect me. And David's like, Julie, I am respecting you. And we go back and forth, back and forth. This happens a lot in the workplace. We need respect here. We're being disrespectful. And yet what's happening is we actually have different ideas. And we talk about it as if we mean the same thing, though. We talk about it as if it's this universal idea of respect. And it's not. And that's why we need to practice curiosity around what does respect mean? to each other at first, actually to myself, because actually a lot of times people, I can say, I want respect. I want respect, but I actually haven't asked myself, what does that mean? And if I don't know what it means to me, how do I expect someone else to know it? So I have to get curious with myself first. Well, that's wow. some pretty deep stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like it. Now, now, Julie, in your book, you know, you talk about the seven forms of respect, but what's that all about? What do you, what do you mean by the seven forms of respect? So uh, when, when I just want to say seven forms of respect works, works more like for, for those in your audience, the five love languages, as in it's about choosing home, which are the ones that matter to me. It's not like seven habits of highly effective people. 
So I just got to be really clear because sometimes people see seven forms of respect and they think, oh, this is going to teach me how to be respectful and I need to do all seven forms. No, it's actually about figuring which are the forms that, that I prioritize that matter to me. And so I got a bookmark here. See this bookmark? These are the seven forms. It's uh, There's procedure, punctuality, information, candor, consideration, acknowledgement, and attention. And these are these are all the different forms. And some of them I, I prioritize. They matter to me. And others I don't. So I'll give you an example of attention. So you think, oh, deep listening. Uh, deep listening is respectful. For other people, it's like multitasking is a sign of performance. If you can't multitask, that means that you're not quick, right? And so it's it shows that how with each of these forms, they can actually be relative. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you're you're what you've said has already changed my view on everything because I never looked at it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure I'm not the only one, but oh, a lot of people are like, wait a minute, because you mean like respect is respect. What do you mean? There are different kinds of respect. No, respect is respect. And actually, the thing is, we can agree on what respect feels like. You know, it feels seen, feeling seen, heard, acknowledged, appreciated. What we disagree about is what does it look like? What does it look like? For some people, multitasking is so, so disrespectful. And other people, it's not a big deal. It's just reflect the reality of the life that we are, the fast paced world that we are living in. And, and yet we kind of all, we have these thoughts like oh, multitasking on their phone and we don't say anything. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it's about being able to have conversations and to practice curiosity around it. Hmm. Thanks. That's, that's good a, stuff. Yeah. Thank you for that question, David. That's a good a big piece of communication here, which is about relationship, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think yes. David really does respect you. I'm sure he does. <laughs> I feel the respect, David. <laughs> so your book, um, tell us about the book and um, what inspired you to write the book? So there was the epiphany moment. And then after, and uh, and then looking back, there was my, um, my community building, my lived experience, and then the research. So I remember I was speaking on this panel on leadership and someone in the audience said, I'm really trying to get my coworker to trust me. And they're just like, and I'm doing all these things, but I can't get them to trust me. I don't know what to do. And I said, well, maybe you're telling him all about your personal life. And what he really wants is for you to show up on time. <laughs> like that's, and that would be what you need to do to get his trust. And that was my kind of like, oh, and I said, it's, it's like kind of like the five love languages. Maybe you have different ideas of what to do there. And so then I was just, so my first question when I started writing this book was, when I started thinking about this was, I didn't have the word respect yet. I just would ask, how do you want to be treated? How do you want to be treated? And then, so I looked back on my community building work. Like I said, when I was at the newspaper, I did a lot of volunteering with nonprofits, right? And I did a lot of bringing together people from very different backgrounds. And what I noticed was there would be friction that would emerge because they had different ideas of how they wanted to be, how they want to be treated. So that was, that's one influence is the community building work. I actually think my nonprofit experience was so critical to just where I am, to where I am now, because I think being in the nonprofit space really exposes us to lots of different people. So that's one is the community building. The second is my lived experience. So growing up Vietnamese in the US and then having lived in the UK, Germany, France, and Vietnam as an adult in all of those different places. I mean, David, you said you lived in, I mean, you were in the military. So, you know, you yeah. know. Right? I've been to the Far East and I've been, yeah, to Europe. Yeah. And, and you know how you can go all those different places and respect and how we treat each other. Those expectations change. Yes. Right. Yes, and so sure. that was, yeah. And that was part of my lived experience. And then the third thing that, in, that, um, inspired actually the respect part was once I started doing the research, once I started conducting the focus groups and, and questionnaires and, and refining, and then people kept saying, I want to be treated with respect. And that's when I said, what does respect mean to you? Yeah. And that's when they kept talking about the golden rule. Yeah. And so that's, those are the three things that inspired the book. 
Well, you know, that's you, such you, a important. Yeah, that's pretty. Oh, I'm sorry, Q. Did okay. you have something? Yeah, I, that's such an important perspective. I was going to be picky here, Dave, and do a part B of my question. <laughs> oh. sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so that's just a reframing. And and we want to treat people like we want to be treated. And that's deadly sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to treat me that way. And, you mm -hmm. know, that, that, I'm just resonating. That was so, that was so much. So you, you were inspired to write the book. But what I heard is you also were inspired because people needed something and you had a message to share. What was your, what was the uh, experience? And if people have, if you haven't written a book, David's working on a new book. I've got 12 working on 13. But it's it's what's your experience having written a book? How did that change you? How did that empower you? Um, well, uh, let me say, I just got to say, this is my second book. My first book is so different. It was about the South Vietnamese military perspective of the Vietnam War. <laughs> and that was based on my undergraduate thesis. And then and then there's this book. And so I think that. Um, the thing about writing a book is that it's like, I mean, I don't have any children, but imagine that we put all our, our hopes and dreams and expressions of ourselves in this, and then we release it to the world. And then they're going to interact with it. And we don't know how they're going to interact with it. And so actually I self-published both the times, my books. And the second time I did it with an Indiegogo campaign and I fundraised that way and I got over 300 supporters in the book uh, to pledge and I know and and um and I remember I felt like it was because I shared it with people that it was not just mine anymore that it was part of this the communities and I also had to be accountable to them so for me it's like I need to get this book done because I committed to this and so then just before the book came out, I ended up writing a letter that I called Dear Book. And it was as if I was writing to a child, like the, it's going to come out in the world. And I don't know what people are going to think. And what's been really fascinating, because the book came out in uh, May 2022, I have learned so much, like in conversations like this, about how to talk about things in more detail that, oh gosh, that's not in the book, <laughs> right? Because it came out afterwards. And I, uh, did you have that experience when you when you wrote yours? It's like, oh, if I had, wish I had done. Now that I'm talking about it more, I wish I'd included it in the book. But that's what another edition is for. Yeah, I'm on the fourth edition of my first book, and I've uh -huh. got, I just write a new book or an ebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now that I stepped all over David's question, I'm going to back up and let him ask it. <laughs> no, that, that's quite all right. That's quite all right. And with regard to the, oh, I wish that was in the book. Yeah, I've I've done second and third editions, mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah, that's what that's for, uh, you know. But let's go back to the, your nonprofit volunteer days and and the respect concept and growing community and that sort of thing and building relationships. How does that work with nonprofits and boards per se? Let's mm -hmm. talk maybe an example or two about a. You said you served on boards. So yes, I served in lots. Of, yeah, see if you served. can help us out. Mm -hmm. understand a little bit with perhaps an example or something. Yeah. So I'll just say that respect lives in layers in organizations. And so I'm going to give you an analogy of language. All right. So if you think about um, there's the organization as a whole, so this is a nonprofit as a whole, right? And then, and then typically it's the board. That's the, the, the leadership of the, and the executive director, but really the executive director is embodying the, the, what the board wants. So Whatever they say are the forms of respect, what they're prioritizing, that's the national language. And then within that nonprofit staff, there could be, hey, here's our fundraising team. And here is our client team, right? Like whoever we're serving. And then um, here's our program team, right? And they all have their own leaders too. And so I think of whatever those leaders are prioritizing, that's what we, uh, it's like, regional dialects. Ah. And then there's me. I'm the individual. I have my own wants and needs too, right? And you know who can succeed best in an organization are those who are multilingual, where I can be with the staff and I can also be with the board. And so it's interesting when I work with bo uh, nonprofits versus when I'm working with just a, with a, um, 
with a private company or when I'm working with government, because there's actually, depending on some organizations have a, a lot of connection between the board and the staff and others, it's just the board's like, oh, the staff is up there. Oh, sorry. The staff thinks that the board is up there. Yeah. Right. And, um, and, and it's okay actually for when we are in our own group to have our own, our own forms of respect that we prioritize, right? It's okay if the board, to, when they're just with each other, it was like, oh, we're going to prioritize this where we, we prioritize candor and yet maybe in the staff, but when they're interacting with the staff, then we think about the org as a whole. No, we're going to prioritize acknowledgement. So also another thing is in the nonprofit sector, it's, the it's not always about pay, right? It's, you're not you're not always going to get as competitive pay as when working corporate. So maybe acknowledgement is going to be more important because of that. And so the nature of the work actually will have an influence on the forms of respect. And the thing that I really try to help organizations do is get away from thinking about what's nice to have, what we should have, because that's respectful. To thinking about what is our work together, what are we doing. And what are we doing on this team? And then what are we doing as an org? And if we would think about it that way, what are the forms of respect do we need to prioritize to uphold that mission? And I will say with nonprofits, it, it is easier to think in terms of mission. Um, sometimes actually to the detriment of the individual. It's like, oh, and there can be a bit of altruism with nonprofits too, where it's just, well, I have to, I have to totally suppress my individual wants and needs because it's about the mission. And and we try to get people to think, well, um, it's not just about the mission, it's also about the nature of the work too and how we work together. Whoa, thanks. I get, I, I'm thinking about this uh, disrespect thing and it you know, gets more intense as you get older. I could say that because I'm an old guy. So, um, you know, we do bring value to the workplace because there's mm -hmm. collective knowledge that old guys have. And the more gray hair I get, mm -hmm. the more I learn from all of my, some people call them mistakes. I call them learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, but the respect thing, and when I feel like I'm not respected, it's like they're wasting my time. Mm -hmm. Ask me to show up and then they're running a stupid meeting, which we're not doing anything. And I, you know, I, that's one of my triggers. Do you, um, you feel comfortable saying, what are some of your triggers? And you feel like you're not respected. And how do you deal with it? Oh, gosh. Um, so what the punctuality is really important to me. And uh, and we actually, in the forms of respect, we encourage people to think about why. Um, and I feel a lot of anxiety around it. Like I feel a lot of, I actually feel physical anxiety around time. It actually has to do with my mom picking me up late from school when I was a kid. And I still, it still kind of comes back. And so I let people know, hey, this is when it's important and this is when it's not important. Or actually when someone's saying, hey, I'm late, rather than saying that's okay, it's like, thanks for acknowledging that. Which is different. No. You're not saying you're a horrible person. She's like, thanks for, thanks for acknowledging that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's I got the, uh, I'm, I'm right there with you on the punctuality thing because mm -hmm. of the way I was raised, you know. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes early is on time. Being on time is late. And literally got that beaten into me. So yeah, I get physically an upset stomach. I'm nauseous. It, yeah. 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 yeah and and in, yeah. And you were in the military too, right? So that's. Oh, yeah. Eight years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So was I. So was mm -hmm. I. And when you, I'm also a conductor. When you got, you pay it for two hour gig. This is a union orchestra. You start, <laughs> and you end on time. Mm -hmm. If not, you're paying overtime. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really important to, to acknowledge that. So that's that's helpful. I, we lied. David I said he had the hardest questions, but I think that was the hardest one. So, all right, you picked out, you picked my interest. You picked the listener's interest. This rubber band thing. Yeah, know? I'm curious. <laughs> all right. So I got a rubber band here. What's See. that? What's the rubber band rule? Tell yeah. us. About the rubber band rule. So the rubber band rule shows how actually when we think about respect, we're actually, we as humans are able to flex. We can stretch, right? So Hugh, I know that you like um, you you like it when I CC you on all these emails. I don't like to do it, but you like getting all these emails. So I'll stretch for you, right? I'll stretch for you, <laughs> right? And then when I'm with Hugh and David, they both um, they both really want me to give them tons of praise. Right? I'm like, all right, 
I'll do it and I'll stretch a little more, right? You know what happens over time when we stretch and stretch and stretch ourselves? You know what I'm going to do? Mm-hmm. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> we snap, yeah. right? So with the rubber band rule, what it's about is we have to know what our breaking points are. What's going to make me snap? And that's different for everyone. So this is actually about self-respect. I need to be able to know myself so that I can tell other people. So remember how I said curiosity, it's a practice and it's and it starts with ourselves. A lot of times people are like, oh, um, that person was, they're being disrespectful. Yeah, I, I've never told them what I need. So with the rubber band rule, I need to know what my breaking points are. I need to be able to communicate that with other people. Which we don't do. We just yeah. think, no, I'm making yeah. notes over yeah. here. And by the way, and by the way, I want to be very clear. So I got a big rubber band right here, right? So everyone's got different rubber bands, right? So some are big and stretchy and like, oh, go with the flow. And other people are like, I'm a tight little rubber band. Don't try, <laughs> right? And it's about knowing. And also we can actually, our rubber band can be different at home versus at work too. Or maybe even like when we're volunteering, maybe like, here I am, I'm the board chair. And at work, I mean, maybe like, I'm like in a really junior role, right? And so, right. And so, and how we are, because it's dynamic, we change. And we change sometimes in the different audiences. So yeah, we got to adjust. Mm -hmm. yeah. seven, seven forms of respect. You want to highlight those for us real quick? Yes. Okay. So again, oh, we use this acronym called PICA, P-P-I-C-C-A-A. And it's procedure, punctuality, information, candor, consideration, acknowledgement, and attention. Whoa, whoa. And I'll bet you have those articulated on your website. I'm going to ask you, so your your website um, mm -hmm. is, uh, let me give people the URL of your website. It is curiosity-based, C-U-R-I-O-S-I-T-Y-based.com. So when people go there, Julie, what are they going to find? So they're going to find a lot about my company. And if they want to find out more about the book, you can click on that forms of respect to the right. And then that will actually take you to the forms of respect website. And that tells you all about that. And you can get a free quiz. There's a free course. Um, we've got this video where I'm actually acting out different forms of respect too. So yes, those are, that's what you'll find on the site. There's even a free mini book. Oh, a free mini book. Where yep, so, mm-hmm. So there is, uh, Hugh, it's been a while since I found the free mini book, but it's on there. Poke around. <laughs> so, right, right. And you okay. can, if you click on book. Actually, click... we're going to include that. If you're listening on a podcast platform, mm -hmm. that'll be in the narrative um, about the podcast. Mm -hmm. The link will be there. And if you go to the nonprofitexchange.org, T-H-E nonprofitexchange.org, um, you'll find it there as well. You'll find a link to her website. And she's also giving you a link for this, this gift. So it's, it's part of her website, but it's a, it's a link that you can find under resources on the website. So that's, that's, that's where it lives. So Julie, we're going to ask you to come back in just a minute. David and I are going to talk about our community. Come back and give us the last word, whatever you want to leave us with today. So David, um, we have a gathering of people around the world every week and around the country. We even have people from Seattle. Guess, guess what? Who are nonprofit leaders or work with nonprofit leaders? We come together, and what do we, so that's that's the tip of the iceberg is the the interaction together. We talk about things like this, Julie. And we'll invite you sometime to come and share with that group about the seven forms of respect. But David, what are some of the things that we do in the community that empower nonprofit leaders? Well, we work routinely. Uh, we have different activities that go on for our members and for. Our last meeting, uh, to be honest with you, we talked about, you know, bringing something to the table of value that you'd like to give. It was a give and ask type of thing. And out of a, about a dozen people, we got one ask because people are want to give, uh, whether it's a tip on a book or it's this or it's that or something. But it was it was all it's a loved based feeling that you get by being included in the organization. And that's how a lot of people learn, but they don't realize it, that, you know, the, the attitude and the um, atmosphere come into play a lot 
And so I think your respect and the forms of respect are an ideal addition to what we're doing. Uh, we have masterminds, uh, we have uh, workshops, uh, we even, Q and I have uh, done workshops in different parts of the country um, on occasion. And so there's a lot of activity. Plus we produce a, a digital magazine every month. Uh, it's called, we, we, it's our non-newsletter newsletter. We call it updates. And uh, we, Hugh always has, he's a great cook, by the way, always has a terrific recipe in there. I always find some weird jokes to put in there. Uh, I pulled the, the content together. We're always looking for guest contributors, Julie. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and you can reach either Hugh or David at centervisionleadership.org for that. And if you wanted to join our community and our listeners and viewers, uh, you can go to the nonprofitcommunity.org. Yeah, that's the, or, that's that's the easy to remember. Like, and there's that's no, easier the, to remember. Or centervisioncommunity.org, and I would recommend you go to the first one. But, yeah. Uh, so there's no there's a free membership and a paid membership there, and you can get a lot of resources uh, and join some people who are really heart centered people that are either are working in nonprofits or clergy or they support nonprofits. And so we're, we've got a nice little community there. You're welcome. And like you said, we have smaller breakout groups that we're able to, people can talk. You get too big a group and you get too lost. It's sort of a one of a kind place where you work on yourself and you work on the skills like you talked about today. So Julie, some, some programs teach these are soft skills, but you know, when you don't do them, it's a pretty hard stop, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what do you want to leave people? This is great stuff, by the way. We'll we'll have it up and ready pretty soon. It'll be on any place you get podcasts, the nonprofit exchange, and there'll be a transcript. So if there's something you want to find, look for it in the transcript. So Julie, what do you want to leave people with today? I um I want you to think next time you feel that you're disrespected, ask yourself, was that disrespect which is intentional, or was it lack of respect in the forms that matter to you? So just pause. Do they intentionally mean that or did they just not know? And if they do, and if you think that maybe it's because they didn't know, then think about how you can communicate that to them. Beautiful. David, another awesome interview, right? I know. It's just, it just keeps getting better. Well, it's been <laughs> it so much fun to be with the two right. of you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julie. God bless you, Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching The Nonprofit Exchange.